good evening. I want to welcome all the students, alumni, faculty, staff, community guests, and friends to the second Powerful Voices speaker series, virtual edition this time for this fall semester. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today. I hope everybody is in good health. If you are joining us from another city or a state, a big Kruger welcome to you. It gives me such a joy to be able to continue this important speaker series, and I thank the Honors College for it, because this series gives us the opportunity to hear from our accomplished alumni for the sake of students it's important, but also for all of us to be inspired by them, to learn from them. Even though we are not in person right now, I know we'll be back together soon. Today, we have a very special alumnus, Mr. Dennis Kennedy. He's going to share with us his story and offer his reflections on a very timely and important topic, justice and equity. So please, let's pay attention. I know it will be a great discussion. It will give us some food for thought and it will definitely challenge us. I'm now going to pass it on to Dr. Christine Lavo-Haley, our Assistant Dean at the Honors College to give a fitting introduction to Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy, for joining us. Christine, it's yours. Thank you, Dr. Couture. Uh, we are very excited for our guest tonight, Dennis Kennedy. Um, he has an unwavering passion for people and works to ensure that all individuals receive equal opportunities in the workplace, regardless of race, ethnicity, sex, religion, age, physical or mental handicaps, physique, gender identity, or sexual orientation. In 2004, Mr. Kennedy walked away from his job to start the Texas Diversity Council because he felt a very strong need to create an organization that would champion diversity and inclusion across the state. Four years later, Mr. Kennedy found himself launching the National Diversity Council for the same reason. He started the State Council. Currently, the National Council is made up of 16 states and regional councils. His vision is to have state and regional diversity councils in all 50 states. Along with these state councils, he has launched several statewide conferences focused on diversity, leadership, and women. Furthermore, Mr. Kennedy launched two additional national organizations in 2011, including the National Women's Council, which focuses on advocacy for women, and the Council for Corporate Responsibility, which seeks to educate organizations on the best practices in social responsibility. In addition, he is the creator of the Diversity First newsletter, a proud product of Diversity First Publishing, which is distributed in 13 states. Prior to his entrepreneurship, Mr. Kennedy spent several years as a college professor in the business schools at the University of Houston downtown, Texas Southern University, and the University of Texas at San Antonio. A graduate from the University of Houston main campus, Mr. Kennedy earned undergraduate degrees in economics, business management, political science, and physical education. He also earned his MBA from the University of Houston. In addition, he was a scholarship athlete for football. Mr. Kennedy is currently working on his book titled Creating Your Significance. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Dennis Kennedy. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and thank you Dr. Couture for, for inviting me. Thank you, I'd like to thank all the students, all the honor students uh, it is very much an honor to have the opportunity to uh, participate in the Powerful Voice um, opportunity to speak to the honor students. So I'm very excited about this opportunity. And um, as was mentioned, I am a former football player at U of H, go Cougs. Uh, I am very proud of the accomplishments of U of H over the last, uh, last decade and what U of H has uh, been, able to, been able to do and excited about being a Cougar. Um, I'm excited about this presentation and look forward to having this, uh, a discussion. Um, I don't know if the, if the presentation, if we can bring up the presentation. Great. So um, if we can go to the next slide. What I would like to do is start off by thanking Chancellor Couture 
I am very grateful for her leadership. U of H has come a long, long way uh, with her leadership. Um, I, I shared with the president. Uh, I remember when U of H was called Cougar High and no one's calling U of H Cougar High any longer. Uh, U of H is the first tier number, first tier university. And it's awesome uh, to see the progress of the university. U of H is adding a medical school, which is colossal, which is you know, unbelievable. So I'm really excited. And I wanna take my hat off to the president and her staff for, for their commitment and all the work that they've done. So one of the things that I wanna do in this conversation um, is I wanted to get personal with the students and share some stories. And in 2019, I had the uh, opportunity to have a private meeting with President Obama for about 20 minutes uh, was him and his uh, security, secret service uh, in the room. But it was a, a great opportunity for me to ask him questions that I was really curious about and um, you know, get some real good takeaways from that conversation. And, but before I do that, um, since we were talking about powerful voices, I, I thought about what powerful voices I've had the opportunity to listen to and sit down with, because I've had the opportunity to sit down with a lot of amazing people. And when I sit down with them, uh, I have a, a series of questions that I ask them and I take notes. And I always ask them, what words best describe you? Uh, what advice uh, do you have for me as a leader? Um, those are the, a couple others, but those are the uh, uh, questions I usually ask these individuals. So what I wanted to do with the next several slides is I want to um, share with you stories of, uh, of powerful voices from other people. And I'm gonna come back to talk about President Obama and my experience, my takeaways with President Obama. So lessons learned from other powerful voices. So I, I wanna share the other powerful voices. So the first powerful voice I wanted to share was that of uh, Vice President Biden. I had the opportunity to meet uh, both Joe and Jill Biden uh, in 2012. And I was invited to the um, Vice President's mansion. It was a private group, about 25 individuals, mostly politicians, uh, individuals in the House, individuals in the Senate, and it was a uh, excellent meeting. But I had an opportunity to, to uh, talk to both uh, Jill and Joe, uh, uh, Vice President Biden, and um, I asked him, you know, questions. And one of the things that Joe, I, he, Joe asked me what I did. I told him I was with the National Diversity Council, Vice President Biden, and um, he asked me you know, what is the National Diversity Council? And I went in detail about the National Diversity Council. And he said, that's tough work. <laughs> he said, champion diversity is tough, you know, it's tough work. And I said, yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, it, it is tough work. And so he shared a few things with me. And one thing he said was, uh, life is long and it's a journey. And be patient. And he was, in regards to my comments around um, how challenging it is to talk about diversity and inclusion in corporate America and how corporate America um, isn't as open as it should be when you talk about inclusion, when you're talking about making sure that everyone feels like they belong. And so he, he encouraged me and he said to share with me to stay focused, that you really need to stay focused and be patient in your endeavor. And I really wanna encourage everyone, um, you know, in, you, in your journey, understand this is, your life is a journey, it's a long journey. And that there will be things that happen that you just need to be patient with and be encouraged. And one of the things he said is that I, to make sure I had a uh, corner, that I had a coach corner that means I had someone in my corner who was my cheerleader, and his wife, um, <laughs> his wife said that I am I am Joe's cheerleader, and uh, it's really important to have people around you that can cheer you on, and um, so those are some of the lessons I learned from Joe, uh, Vice President Biden. Some of you may not recognize uh, General Colin Powell. He was uh, another generation. Uh, 
but he was the first African-American Secretary of State. I've had the opportunity to meet with him five on, on five different occasions uh, since 2008. And um, he is a remarkable individual. And what he talked about was um, having a uh, optimistic attitude, is really having an optimistic attitude and um, don't allow things to deter your attitude, always be optimistic. And he really encouraged me uh, also to be a problem solver, not to be a complainer, but to be a person that uh, solves problems and not the person that goes around complaining. Uh, in, a, in addition to that, he, he talked to me about the importance of integrity, is let your yeses be yeses and your noes be noes. And that always, that's always stuck with me. Uh, his comments um, to me have always stuck with me and I think they're very powerful. Some of you, most of you probably don't know who this guy is. <laughs> this is Dr. Cornell West. So I've, Dr. Cornell West has become my good friend. Uh, he is a uh, uh, first African-American to graduate with a PhD from Harvard. Um, I've known Dr. Cornell West for about, um, about 12 years now and um, very, very powerful uh, individual. He teaches at both Harvard and Princeton, um, dual um, teacher and he, he trades off per semester, um, but very wise man. And um, he shared with me, I asked him, um, you know, what wise, uh, you know, what advice would you have for me? And one of the things he told me is always speak the truth, no matter what, and always be candid. And um, he, he also sure shared with me um, that it's really important when we look at the African-American community and we, we see the extreme poverty to put it in context of our history and, um, and don't judge our community. And I know that as African-American, some of us have a, the propensity to uh, judge our communities based on our, the lack, uh, the, the extreme poverty, the poverty in our various communities. And he really shared with me the whole judgment and really un get a better, deeper understanding of our history. And he really encouraged me to start reading African-American history books in which I, which I had started doing and uh, it was really helpful to put in context where the black community is today. Um, in addition to that, he talked to me about the importance of building relationships, um, how it's important not only to meet people, but to get to know people and build long lasting relationships with people. And that it's important to build a coalition of people. Um, Dr. Cornell West has put out a, a, a lot of books um, one is Race Matters. Uh, I thoroughly, I've read that multiple times. It's a great book. Um, sometimes he's seen as very controversial, uh, but he's just very candid and very encouraging. And so um, those are the words that he shared with me. So I had the opportunity to meet Angela Bassett and all these people that I'm, I'm showing, I invited them to my conference. And for each of these meetings, I had the opportunity to uh, sit down with them, and, and I was really excited uh, for the opportunity to meet Angela Bassett. Um, some of you may be very familiar with her work, um, and some of you may be very surprised to learn that she's actually 62. I met her when she was 60. She turned 60. She's 60 in that picture. Can you believe it? <laughs> and so um, I had the opportunity to sit down with her. And I asked her, how would she best describe herself? And she said persistent, that that's a word that she would describe herself as persistent. And um, I asked her why she would use that word persistent. And she said, because over the time of her career that she's been rejected so, so often for roles that she really wanted that were not for African-Americans and that, um, she was continued to be persistent to seek out those opportunities 
uh, for lead roles that even though they weren't written for, for African-American, she would ask to, um, you know, ask for those type of roles. Uh, she wanted to be lead roles. And she said it was very difficult for African-Americans to get those type of roles, but she was um, persistent and continue um, to seek out those roles. In addition, she also mentioned that in Hollywood, you have to be very patient. Um, and that's something I, a consistent theme I heard among a lot of people was just being patient and learning to be patient. And that's really, really uh, important. In addition, um, she talked about the importance of defining who you are and not, allow, not allowing other people to define who you are. And that was um, you know, something I took to heart when you talk about creating a personal brand. And uh, Jeb Bush, I invited Jeb Bush. Some of you may not be familiar with Jeb Bush. He's President Bush's brother, younger brother. And he's actually was governor of Florida for many years. And um, bringing Jeb uh, Bush Governor Bush to the conference was controversial. Uh, he is uh, not seen as someone that champions diversity and inclusion, uh, but many people don't know he's married to a Latino and that he uh, you know, has biracial kids and is an advocate for diversity and inclusion. And he shared with me um, some stories um, and one which he, why he moved and left Texas. And, and that was because uh, his family wasn't accepted. So in 1980, uh, he left, packed up to um, Texas and he moved to, to uh, Florida and uh, later on became governor of Florida. Um, but uh, his advice to me was to be loud and be patient. And um, what he meant by be, be loud, and that was um, to make your voices heard in a very crowded environment to make your voices heard around diversity, around advocating for diversity and inclusion. And um, um, he was very uh, outspoken, outspoken about making sure that everyone's voice is heard at the table and um, how it's important to make room for other people at the table. And so, um, and his, his, uh, his one um, advice that stood out for me is that to be bold, when you have opportunities to be bold, you know, to have courage uh, when you're out there and you're speaking to people. And that resonated with me um, you know, with the opportunities that I have to go out and speak to leaders is to really be bold and talk to these leaders and be, uh, be encouraged. So Spike Lee, I don't know if anyone knows who Spike Lee is. He's from another generation, but uh, Spike Lee is amazing. He's a funny guy. And uh, he, he shared some, some wise words of wisdom with me. Uh, I was, um, um, I was uh, very impressed with Spike. I've met him several times. He's come to our conference several times and um, he, he's a wise guy. So in the media, for those that know his persona in the media is that you know he's outspoken. He's very, very outspoken. But he shared with me that I shouldn't be as outspoken and that I, I should be willing to listen. It's important to listen to others. And, um, you know, that was something I was surprised to hear. Um, he also um, said to surround that I need to make sure, and I met him early on when I started the council and then later on, but he also shared with me the importance of surrounding yourself with good people. And, you know, that goes a long way that for all of us, as you um, live your life to make sure you surround yourself with, with, with uh, good people. And um, he also mentioned the importance, uh, very similar to Angela Bassett, is to define who you are and focus on your personal brand and don't let other people define who you are, uh, which I thought was wise, wise words. 
And um, he also said, you know, it's, it's really important to make good decisions uh, as well. And so those were, um, you know, his words from, from Spike Lee that I, I found to be very valuable. So many of you should know Julian Castro. Uh, Julian Castro was the former Secretary of HUD under President Obama. And uh, he is a uh, Harvard graduate, Harvard Law. Um, and so I asked him uh, what, does, what words describe him best. And he said, thinker, hard worker, and love my family. Uh, when I asked him what advice that he may have for me, he talked about the importance of building relationships. Uh, he also talked about the importance of, of, of um, pivoting when, um, when things are not working, looking for other opportunities, um, how important it is to uh, understand the environment that you're in um, when things are not going the way you would like them to go and you need to pivot and make changes and to be aware of the environment. Uh, so those were um, um, his advice to me. So before I go on, those I, I wanted to share those powerful words. I had the opportunity to sit down with each and every one of those individuals uh, for uh, you know 15 to 30 minutes before they presented at the conference. And I wanted to share with you some of the words that they shared with me. And this is over a period of 15 years that I've met uh, some of these people. And some of these people I've had the opportunity to meet uh, multiple, multiple times. So now I want to talk about my D, my my diversity and inclusion journey, and creating the National Diversity Council. So I'm going to start off with the why. All the students received this report. It's the Texas the Texas Fortune 1000 uh, Corporate Governance Report, and um, what we're going to go through is I didn't. You have the report, so I only put two slides in the presentation but I, I really wanna encourage you to read the report. And there were some additional attachments that were included as well. If you would take some time to read that and better understand what, what I'm about to jump into. So the question is, I get the question very often, why did you, um, why did you um, quit your job and start the uh, Texas Diversity Council? So what you're looking at and you have this in your document, what you're looking at is the breakdown of demographics of leadership teams of Fortune 1000 companies headquartered in Texas. Um, and there are um, over 70 uh, Fortune 1000 companies headquartered in Texas. And you're looking at the demographic makeup of the leadership team of these companies. And so um, looking at the pie chart, White men make up 72% of leaders of Fortune 1000 companies. Uh, white women make up 17%. Uh, men of color make up uh, almost 8%. Women of color make up uh, 3%, uh, live almost 3%. Um, and then below that, you can actually see the numbers. So when you look at this, and let me just back up. So this is 2020 data. The first time I did this report was when I left my place of em employment and the numbers were different. It was 90% white males, 7% white women and 3% minority. Um, and so, the, so there's been a change. There's been more diversity added to corporate leadership. Uh, when I walked in the doors of corporate America, and I remember very vividly going to uh, oil and gas companies for second interviews and seeing absolutely no one that looked like me. Uh, as I walked, was taken from floor to floor, going on the trading floor floor of Dynegy that, that was uh, bought out, um, and seeing absolutely no, no people of color, no African Americans. And it wasn't that I was looking for African-Americans, but it just stood out to me um, that there wasn't any people of color and there wasn't any people of color interviewing me. And it really stood out. And um, I remember um, having experience interviewing 
after finishing my MBA, um, going for a second interview, interviewing, and the interview lasted for five minutes. <laughs> the interview lasted for five minutes and the recruiter apologized to me uh, afterwards. Um, but um, it, it, it was just a weird, a very weird feeling. But now it makes a whole lot, sen a lot of sense to me. It was an organization that had a monolithic culture. Uh, a monolithic culture is a culture with high racism, high discrimination, and is dominated by one group of people. And um, it's, it's very common when you look at senior leadership teams uh, that you don't see people of color represented and you don't see um, uh, women represented at, at, at all either. Um, and so when you want to see change, um, if you're going to see change, you have to be the person advocating for change. You can't wait for someone else to advocate for change. So um, as was mentioned, um, you know, this was one of the, you know, the lack of opportunity for development. Once I got into corporate America, uh, I worked for a great company and I, I drank all the Kool-Aid and I really enjoyed the company I worked for, but the company didn't have any women and didn't have any people of color in leadership. Though it had a high percentage of, of, of um, uh, women working for the organization, there was no women in leadership. So the next slide is comparing 2016, 2018, and 2020, looking at the demographics. And what you see is you'll see that corporate, corporate, America, corporate America is becoming more and more diverse, right? So in Texas, when we look at the demographics in Texas, minorities are the majority in the state of Texas. But when you look at the numbers, it, it doesn't reflect in the numbers of hiring and leadership, whether it be on corporate boards or senior leadership team. Um, you see a bias, statistical bias in, uh, in these numbers. Um, in the state of Texas, uh, white males make up about um, around 20, 22% uh, of the population. Um, uh, at the national level, they, they make up about 30% of the population. Um, and so when you look at these numbers, um, uh, white males are over significantly overrepresented in leadership roles. And to really get a better understanding of that, uh, to really get a better understanding of that is really look at our history. And I love sharing a story. Um, my mother, both my parents graduated from college. My father was born in 33. My mother was born in, in 39. And both ended up going to college in a time in which African-Americans didn't go to college. And my mother knew that her going to college, she only had two job opportunities, two job opportunities she could either be a nurse or she can be a teacher because African-Americans did not work corporate jobs. Uh, and so she didn't have those opportunities. And so she became a teacher and she enjoyed being a teacher, um, but that wasn't what she wanted to do. She wanted to do work in corporate. She wanted to have opportunities that other people had. And likewise was my father. And uh, they just didn't have those opportunities. Today, um, there are more opportunities for people of color and women than ever, ever before. I am um, so proud of uh, a lot of organizations are doing diversity right. Um, however, there are a lot of organizations uh, that are not doing diversity at all. Also included in the document that I sent you is a list of companies that have no women or, and, and or no people of color in leadership in Texas. So that means their senior leadership team and their board of directors. So this is 2020 and we still struggle with including women. Women are 50% of the workplace and we still struggle with including women uh, in the C-suite, which they call the executive uh, suite, 
as well as the um, board of directors. It's not that women are not qualified, it's that men choose not to be inclusive. Men in positions of power choose not to be inclusive. There are plenty of people that can serve on boards, serve as leaders, um, but they're just not afforded the opportunity. Um, and so my experiences led me to start the National Diversity Council. And um, I put my two weeks notice in on um, uh, February, the February 3rd, 2004. And my boss thought, thought asked me why I was quitting. <laughs> she, I had a nice corporate job. I had a, a mortgage that was $2,500 a month. I had a, a nice sports, sports car, $1,000 car note a month. And I was quitting my job. And to be honest with you, I didn't want to quit my job but I wanted to champion diversity and inclusion. And I wanted to advocate because I felt strongly, very, very strongly that what was taking place in the workplace was wrong. And um, what really, um, uh, really moved me was a project that I worked on looking at pay equity and um, I, I didn't know that women were paid differently than men. And, you know, when a woman graduate, when a female graduates from U of H, that female will make less than the, than the male counterpart who's graduating with the same degree with lesser grade GPA, all because he's a male. And our society values males more, values males and discounts women in the workplace. And it's really unfortunate. So. When I quit my job, I didn't have a, I had a vision and um, I didn't know exactly how I was gonna piece the National, the National Diversity Council together. At the time it was the Texas Diversity Council, but I had a vision. And the first two weeks after I put my, I, you know, the day I put my, my two weeks notice in, the first thing I did was I called my mother and I said, mom, I wanna take you and dad out to your favorite restaurant. Uh, you know, meet me there. And I shared it, you know, shared with my parents that I quit, put my two weeks notice in. And my dad's a very quiet, quiet individual. He didn't have much to say, but my mom had a lot to say. <laughs> she had a lot to say. And, um, but I was, I was determined to, to start the council. And the first two weeks after leaving my place of employment, I called every CEO office in the Fortune 1000 at the time. And I left messages for all of them. This is before there was a, a you know, all the social media, uh, LinkedIn, all things of that, that nature. Back then you would pick up the phone and you would call people. And I called every CEO at every company and I left a message for all of them. At the end of two weeks, guess how many CEOs call me back? None. And I remember waking up being disheartened because I wanted to talk to important people. But I realized that important people want to talk to important people and I wasn't an important person. And so I realized that what I needed to do was aim lower and meet with people in the organization, no matter what their job title is and talk to them about the importance of diversity. And um, and these meetings had to be in person because that's how, you know, 15, you know, 17 years ago, that's pretty much was in-person meetings. Um, and so what I did is I started traveling around the state of Texas and I would go for a week and my goal was to meet with 20 companies. I drive to Houston for a week meet with 20 companies, drive to Austin, meet with a few, drive to San Antonio, 20 companies. And I did that for a whole year. And I, I met with hundreds of companies. And at the end of the year, I had 72 companies that joined the Texas Diversity Council. 72 companies that wanted to learn and grow in the area of diversity. 
Uh, majority of them were, were not Fortune 1000 companies. But those 72 companies invested $1,000 each. Um, and so that was the start of the Texas Diversity Council. And um, I remember two weeks after I put my, my notice in, I signed a contract to hold the first annual Texas Diversity and Leadership Conference at the Marriott River Center in San Antonio. And I signed a contract and the contract was $150,000. And I had, I had $1,000 that was committed from an organization. And I had almost 12 months to raise the rest of the money. And 12 months later, we had our first conference. I raised the money. And that was the first, that was the first conference, diversity conference that I led. Um, and this year will be our 17th annual conference that will be taking place next week. It will be virtual conference. And we're really excited about that conference. Um, but back to my DEI journey. Um, so after starting the Texas Diversity Council, um, I, I had some organizations outside of Texas that asked me to uh, start organizations um, na a national organization. They wanted to be in, involved in Florida. They wanted to be involved in California. And so some of these companies had offices and there were members in Texas had offices in other places. So I launched the National Diversity Council in two, 2008, uh, invested my own money to, to launch the, the National Diversity Council, as well as the Texas Diversity Council. Uh, many people think, you know, um, when you're launching a nonprofit organization, it doesn't take money. Quite the contrary, I invested over $100,000 to start the National, the, the Texas Diversity Council. I was really passionate about the topic and really passionate about making a different difference and advocating for change in corporations. Uh, so the National Diverse Council started in 2008 and I spent about, um, when I launched the National Diversity Council, I spent about 24 days a month on the road um, between Florida and California, really just meeting people, developing relationships, uh, introducing individuals and companies to the Diversity Council and the benefits of the Diversity Council. And, um, you know, very fortunate that um, a lot of organizations saw the benefit, the need for diversity and inclusion and became part of the, of the council. And was very thankful that I was able to put together a team of people uh, to help me with this endeavor of establishing the National Diversity Council and really advocating for diversity and inclusion. Uh, which is very much well needed uh, in corporate America. Uh, our niche is we, we focus on uh, educating organizations in corporate America, whether it be implicit bias or helping, uh, helping organizations understand that a diverse team um, is more well-equipped than a homogeneous team that has no differences. And so, um, it is really, really difficult conversation for uh, individuals and corporations um, around diversity, equity, inclusion. However, with the killing of George Floyd, that really struck a chord with a lot of uh, corporations, a lot of individuals who want to address racial equity within their organization, address uh, inclusion. I was on a conference call today with a uh, billion dollar entity uh, with their um, chief HR officer, chief Ap Op operations officer, and um, they, their senior leadership team does not reflect the diversity of their workforce. Uh, their senior leadership team, their board of directors uh, are all, all white, and um, they want to change that. And they truly, truly want to be inclusive. And we had great dialogue. It was our second, uh, second meeting. And we're providing consulting services to this organization and seek to help them in their efforts around creating an inclusive culture. And all that's, it, it all starts with a cultural assessment in which we go into an organization 
and look at both quantitative and qualitative data. And based on that da data, we, we um, put together the diversity plan and strategy and implementation. So the mission and vision, I'm, I'm not gonna read the, the mission and vision, but you can uh, uh, take a minute and read the mission and vision of the, of the council. Um, but the work that we do is very, very important. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to champion diversity in the workplace. And unfortunately, some cultures um, don't allow um, for those conversations to take place. Um, and so we really hope, you know, the National Diversity Council is really looking for an opportunity to help those organizations that find challenges around diversity, equity, and inclusion, whether it be helping them find the right talent or training, coaching, for example, we're providing leadership coaching for a organization here in, in Houston, Texas around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'll be candid with you, it's very, very difficult for some people to really understand um, that, you know, the importance of diversity and inclusion to really understand um, why you should look to be inclusive um, and really understand racism. Um, racism isn't a term that you hear very often in corporate America. In fact, I would say you rarely would ever hear the term racism in corporate America um, brought up, um, but it, um, you know, implicit bias, uh, unconscious bias um, is something that is very real and takes place in all facets of life. Um, we're all biased. Everybody that's on this call is biased. I am biased. And I'm gonna give you uh, an example, um, one example of my bias. And um, going back um, to when I was uh, a, a young man and uh, was a student there at U University of Houston. So I, I share with everyone that, um, you know, both my parents graduated from college which afforded us a middle-class, we were a middle-class family. And I grew up in a all, all white community. Um, there's 300 homes, three black families, two Latino families um, in our whole uh, sub, you know, where I lived. Uh, I grew up, um, you know, definitely in elementary school, being the only African-American in my class, you know, 25 or 20, how many is in the class, all the way up to fifth grade. Um, when we moved to a different um, district. Um, and when I went off to college at the University of Houston um, in 1985, um, we, the football players had their own cafeteria. And um, unbeknownst to uh, me, there was a lot of uh, division. And my roommate, who was African-American one day, called me a white boy. And I said to him, why, you know, I, I didn't know exactly what that meant, uh, but um, I knew it wasn't good if I was on a team with, you know, 70 after, after African-Americans. So he essentially said that I didn't sit in a cafeteria with the black football players, I always sat in a cafeteria with the white football players. And that didn't, that didn't uh, resonate with me. And he shared with me the black football players sit on the left and the white players sit on the right. right. And sure enough, next time I went in the cafeteria, you know, he was, he was right. All the black football players sat on left and I felt most comfortable sitting with wh white football players because that's the environment that I grew up in. I was most comfortable around white people and wasn't comfortable around black people. And so we all have biases, whether we're cognizant of them or we're not cognizant of them, um, how it impacts the workplace is colossal um, because uh, it, you can get a great job and be working for a great company, but if you don't have the opportunity to be developed and move, move up, you'll be stuck in the same job for 10, 15 years before you leave because 
the organization is not inclusive and not a multicultural organization. It doesn't value differences. I'm gonna be really quick. So 12 years as a student, I didn't realize I, I was so behind. Uh, I spent 12 years as a student there at U of H, um, I have several degrees. The best thing that ever happened to me was to go to University of Houston. Uh, it was never my intention to spend 12 years there at U of H. Um, I have these degrees. I wanted to show you my first semester, my first year in college, what, what classes I took. I graduated the bottom quarter of my class, bottom 30% of my high school class with a 1.96. Uh, I scored 11 uh, on the SAT, on the ACT. Um, I was reading on a fifth and sixth grade level when I went to college as a freshman and I couldn't write a sentence. So the courses I took as a freshman at U of H were courses they had for football players. And I took those courses. I was very fortunate enough to um, um, uh, get a mentor while I was in college to point me in the right direction. Uh, everyone was sent the article, The Learning Curve. If you get a chance to read that, uh, read that article, it tells you more about my journey through education. Uh, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity to go to the University of Houston. Uh, there I learned a lot. And because I am successful because of the teachers and faculty members at, at that school. Real quickly, I wanna mention the things that I learned from President Obama and uh, really, really important stuff. And so Obama is amazing. The opportunity to meet him, amazing. Uh, the opportunity to meet President Obama was amazing. Um, and um, the things I wanted to leave with you because I'm running out of time is I asked President Obama, when did you know you were gonna be president of the United States or wanted to run for president? And he said that he had a vision for service, serving the community, and that led him to become president. And, and he said, it's important to have a vision. And I wanna leave this with you and leave this. And it's so important that you have a vision. You necessarily don't need to have a vision today as a college freshman, sophomore, and so on but you need to have a vision for your life and where you wanna go. Second thing he said, he wanted me to talk about, he has a, a mentoring program. Um, it's uh, My Brother's Keeper. Some of you may be familiar with that. And he talked about the importance of mentoring. And so I asked him, I said, do you, did you, do you have mentors? Did you, did you have mentors? And he said, yes, definitely. I had mentors throughout my life and I still have mentors. And so I really wanna recommend uh, to everyone to call, to identify it behooves you to have mentors in your life because they can make that wiggly line straight and help you and coach you through uh, decisions that you have to make uh, as you go on. What I did is I created a personal board of directors um, and I leveraged those board of directors uh, to, to become a successful entrepreneur, successful advocate for diversity and inclusion. So I really want to encourage that. In addition to that, um, uh, President also mentioned the, the importance of servant leadership. So I asked him to describe his leadership style and he talked about servant leadership and, and I'm gonna leave it at that. For those on the phone that don't know servant leader, leadership means, please Google, Google that and I'll stop right there because there's some Q and A. Okay, let's see. I am so All sorry right. for going No problem, away. no problem. We didn't, we, it was so interesting. We were like, just keep on going. Um, but we do have some questions and I thought it would be nice if we can, I'll see if this works for the people to actually be able to ask their questions. So Regina Balder, you're up first and I'm going to see if I can allow you to talk. All right, you should be up. Hi, hello. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask who who is your, I think you just mentioned that you, formed your own personal board of, of directors, but in, you know, I, I'm kind of going back to your uh, Jill and, and uh, Joe Biden conversation around her being his cheerleader. I was curious, who is your cheerleader? And then the second part of that question is really just how you, how do you keep, you know, keep up the persistence and the perseverance of, of doing what you, what you do? Yeah. So throughout my life, I've, I've been very fortunate. Um, when I when I was a college student at U University of Houston and um, decided not to take the football classes and actually take real classes there at University of Houston, 
I started failing all of my classes. And I had someone in my life that told me not to quit. And she was my cheerleader. And so throughout my life, I've had multiple cheerleaders. And now today, my mom is my biggest cheerleader. And, um, and so um, I'm very grateful for those uh, individuals. I mean, I am where I am because of other people. And um, I want to do a shout out to um, the um, one of the assistant deans at Bauer, and he's <laughs> forgetting his name on top of my head. But uh, when I was an undergraduate student there, he gave me some really good advice. And uh, I live with that advice to this day. And then okay. go ahead. All right, next question, is that fine? Yeah. Okay, um, this is from Sandra, Tennessee, and you are unmuted if you wanna ask that question, Sandra. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. LeBeau Haley. Hey, Dennis, how are hey. you? Good. So thank you so much for sharing your story, it was amazing. Um, I'm happy that I've participated in your conferences in the past and, and to just hear your story and how it all came together is an inspiration. Since you're a, a corporate guy, I want to know, did you have a business plan when you left your job? And, and how did you decide that you could sustain yourself with this type of, of work? So I, I'm not a, I'm, I'm a visionary guy. I'm not a detailed guy at all. So anyone that works for me, they say, Dennis comes with big visions, but he has any details. I, I'm not a detailed person. So the only thing I had is I, I had a spreadsheet with my finances because I had a house note that was $2,500, had a car note that was 1000 and I, I had a spreadsheet saying, this is how long I can live without bringing in income. And um, I learned as I, I went. One thing I didn't mention was after the two weeks where no one called me back, I've, I, I, had a, I had a flawed strategy and I changed my strategy and I, I took it from the movie, Build It and They'll Come, I forget the name of the movie, uh, but there's a scene in there, building there come. And what I did was I put together a 12 month agenda and I signed contracts at the Marriott, at multiple hotels, the Westin Galleria, and, and I put together an agenda for the 12 months that's gonna happen with this council and signed these contracts at all these nice hotels because I didn't have a brand and was trying to build legitimacy in my effort. And so, um, you know, I, I didn't have a plan. I, I didn't have an overall plan, no. Wow, thank you. And, and, and the thing is, I didn't know if I can monetize my effort, but the thing is, this is my thought process was, I can always go back to corporate America. Mm -hmm. I could always go get a job at corporate. And I didn't want to look back and be you know, look back on my life and say, I remember I had this vision and I never did anything with it. And this very vision led me to meet the first African American president, which was just blew my mind. <laughs> All right, thank you. And we have, uh, let's see, oh, did she just leave? Um, Chelsea Watson. Hi, I echo that sentiment as well. Thank you so much for sharing your story and having this talk it's very much so timely. Um, I just wanted to ask um, if you had any specific advice for those of us that have been pushing for DEI in our respective fields. Um, I personally am in healthcare. Um, however, there's not been a lot of support from my company um, as well as um, them not wanting to compensate for that work. And I do believe that that work has to be invested in I just wanted to know if you had any specific advice for those of us who are kind of struggling with, with that. Right, so um, it's always easier to roll a barrel down a hill than push it up a hill. And so um, unfortunately you work for an organization that doesn't see any value in diversity. So you're pushing the barrel up the hill and that's a real, that's a real challenge for, uh, for organizations. And what I tell, what I tell individuals is to go ahead and start a internal diversity council with your own doing that you won't get support from your organization, but start engaging uh, individuals that have the same that that's, have the same view that you have and see the same value that diversity brings, and start meeting and then invite me to come to your to your place and speak and 
and let me start advertising it on social media. And then they will have to address it. Sometimes, sometimes it you know, won't work, but please include me. I would love to help you in your efforts at, at where you're at. I definitely will. I just added you on LinkedIn, so I'll be oh. reaching out. Okay, I got Thank 10 you, LinkedIn accounts. Just email me at dennis.kennedy at dennis.kennedy.org. I don't manage my LinkedIn accounts. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. All right, thank you. All right, and maybe we can post that email, um, Jasmine. I don't know if that's possible to post that. Yeah, dennis.kennedy at dennis.kennedy.org. Okay, great. And then we have, I think we have time for a couple more questions. We have Neha um, Anand. Yes, hi. Um, it was great to hear your story. I am all about stories um, uh, and it was uh, absolutely motivating. So what I wanted to know is that, um, have you or your organization faced any major pushbacks in the kind of work that you wanted to do and, uh, and the goals that you wanted to support that you would wanna share with us? And why did you, um, uh, 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 why, you why would you say that? And what, what did you do to overcome if there okay. weren't any? Yeah, so there's certain industries that you get a lot of pushback. And one here in Texas is the oil and gas industry. Uh, the whole industry, it, it is um, fraught with, um, um, you know, old school monolithic cultures that are not inclusive and not only to people of color, uh, but to women. And so, what I decided to do to address that is that I recently launched the Energy Diversity Council to target that industry specifically. And Forbes Magazine did an article on the launch of the Energy Diversity Council. Uh, and our goal is to go into organizations and to be best help under, you know, educate them uh, because very often people think it's a zero sum game. If, I, if, if there's a woman sitting at the table, that means a man has to get up. No, just add another chair to the table. There's plenty of room at the table. Just add some more ch chairs to the table and um, you know, be inclusive. And so you know, some of these organizations, uh, unfortunately, you have to put out reports, like the report that we put out, uh, that shows that they're not you know, companies that are not inclusive. This is the first time uh, if, if you haven't received the document that actually lists the names of the companies uh, that don't have women and don't have people, color, that's the first time, first time we've done that. Uh, in 2007, the first study had, there was 90 companies, 70 companies, 71 companies had no women on boards and senior leadership team in 2004. And so, um, you know, th there's a lot of work to be done. Definitely. Thank you so much. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. And Christina, uh, Christina, I can go longer if you would like to go. Okay, longer. if that's okay. fine, and if, if, if thank you so much, Dennis. If yeah, people I, have to I, drop I, off, we I understand. went over. Oh no, no problem. Thank you. I really, we really appreciate it. Okay, then in that case, um, let's ask. Uh, let's see. We have Carol. Let's see if I can get it up. I was thinking we were going to close down. So hold on one second. Let me get the next name. Um, so this is. Uh, no, now I've lost it. I'm going to ask this particular question. This is from Carolyn Taylor. Um, so proud of all your accomplishments since knowing you at the University of Houston. Oh, now I need to find her. Um, since knowing you at the University of Houston, uh, former Good News Choir. Does, does that ring a bell? <laughs> okay. Um, I can't sing a lick. Okay, let's. Okay, do you know Carolyn? Yes, I sure okay. do. So uh, here we go, Carolyn. All right, you're on, Carolyn. Hi, Dennis. Great to see hey. you once again. So proud of everything that you've Thank you. Thank um, you. I wanted to ask about your fundraising. Um, you spoke earlier about raising funds for getting your National Diversity Council um, off the ground and making the impact that you're making. Um, and I wanted to ask your thoughts on, on the way some of the best practices for increasing diversity within the fundraising world. That's actually the world that I operate in actually mm -hmm. at the University of Houston. Um, so yeah, what are your thoughts on increasing diversity and inclusion within the fundraising world? Yeah, you know, once again, uh, you know, certain industries um, like the travel industry, there's certain industries that are really challenged with inclusion. 
in um, putting together a strategy to make sure that um, they're recruiting diverse talent. Um, that industry, and I, I, I don't really know all the, uh, know the details of that industry specifically, uh, of raising funds as an industry around that. Um, but all these challenges, you know, real estate industry, all these industries, um, you know, have to look at how they can create inclusive cultures because you can go out and recruit talent, but talent won't stay. You know, very often I get a call and says, how do I, how do I retain our, our diverse talent? And I say specifically, what are you doing for your white employees that you're not doing for your employees of color? And, um, and so um, understand this, everything starts at the top. Everything starts at the top. Um, and so it starts with leadership. And so uh, I, would, I would say, you know, challenge your leadership, uh, challenge leadership and, um, and accountability. Thank you. All right, Thank we you. have uh, Alejandro uh, Basalto. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. So um, I'm a doctoral student at View of Age, and um, I would like to ask you what any specific advice do you have for addressing this problem of diversity in academia? Yeah, well, you know, the higher, the, you know, the challenge in academia, you know, is, is colossal, right? Because you have, um, you know, smart students that may not uh, be prepared to go to, go to college because of their high school is ill-equipped Ill to prepare them to go to college and they necessarily uh, don't do well on um, tests. Um, so, um, you know, starting, starting at, you know, high school all the way through uh, college. Um, but the, it's, it's incumbent upon the universities to go out and recruit students of color, uh, talented students, and create a pipeline um, uh, for students. Now, when you talk about the PhD program, you know, PhDs, uh, specifically African-Americans, are, are, is really, a, um, you won't find a lot of African-Americans with PhDs. Um, I don't know what the, the answer is for that. I know that there's a PhD project. There's ser several initiatives facilitating African-Americans, you know, getting their PhD. Um, but academia as a whole, uh, certain universities are very challenged. Uh, but just keep in mind that America is moving away from a monolithic workplace. 20 years ago, um, you know, you wouldn't, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, there wouldn't be a person of color president at the University of Houston. There was no people of color presidents at any of the major universities in Texas. And so we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it feels a little bit uh, slow, especially someone on the verge of looking for a job. But yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question. Medhat, are you still here? Medhat? Yes, I'm here. OK, um, please ask your question. Well, thank you so much for coming today. I'm, I'm a cougar as well. I got my PhD from U of H. Now I'm an associate professor at the College of Technology. So it's wonderful to see you and wonderful talk today. So my question today is just like about the, the time that we are living in right now. Um, you know, uh, our students and even everybody now is, is facing a lot and many challenges. You have met with a lot of wonderful leaders and the great leaders of America. What would be your advice to our students nowadays? Um, overall general advice, you know, because everyone, your, your student body is so diverse and individuals have different goals, different aspirations on what they want to do. You know, I'm a, I'm a Bauer graduate. I mean, though I, I did study in you know, social science, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm, a Bauer graduate, and I believe um, that I can make a difference. And that's why I quit my job. Um, I was very fortunate enough to find something I'm very passionate about, and it doesn't feel like work to me. 
uh, every day I get up and you know I do something that I'm 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 really passionate about. Um, and so the the advice that I can give a student would be a function of where they're at, but just general advice I would give them is some of the stuff that I was given, um, you know, having the opportunity to, to meet with General Powell and him telling me to make sure your yeses are yeses and your noes are noes, and that your word is 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 gold and that you, you know, you live by your word. Um, you know, I, I think that's you know so true is you know his advice. Uh, with other advice that I received from other people, all encouraging advice uh, has really helped me, uh, has really shaped me and, um, you know, facilitated uh, my growth as an individual and as a leader. And so um, I don't know if that answers your question. It does. Thank you so much. Excellent. I think that's all we have time for. I know everyone else is muted, so I'm going to give you a, a roaring hand well, thank you. for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and your message tonight. Yeah, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it, Christine. All right. Thank you very much. And everyone have a wonderful evening. Good night. Good night.